<clears throat> All right, folks, welcome back to the channel. I have no idea if there's anyone out there listening or listening or not, but uh, I am on vacation, so I'm having a little bit of trouble finding the motivation to make prepared videos on the subject, so I thought I'd do some live streams kind of when I had the chance to do a live stream here and there, and uh, my dad uh, wants to go and do a pub crawl with me here in about two hours or so, so I thought I'd do a live stream Wanted to talk a little bit about the elephant in the room. Let's talk about Chinese delisting of stocks right now, whether or not that's going to happen. Um, so look, folks, in the past, I have been of the opinion that this probably was not going to happen, that within the three-year time frame, there would be some sort of negotiated settlement because typically that's what the United States and China does. They sit around a table and, and they negotiate these kinds of deals and they end up getting solved through a trade deal one sort or another, right? In this case though, uh, this law was passed six months ago. There really has been zero progress in negotiations at this point. Um, the stage one of the deal that, that China signed and sealed, with, well, there's nothing really signed or approved by Congress, but it looks like no one's living up to their obligations in that respect. But let's talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in particular with that deal right now uh, when it comes to Chinese delisting and what this whole thing surrounding Didi, the uh, the Chinese ride hailing company that just went public, can tell us about the future of some of our favorite stocks like NEO, Xpeng, and, and a lot of other things that are going on up there. So um, I think it's actually kind of, a, kind of an important deal. And let's talk about that just for a moment. Uh, Nicholas... I uh, wanted to say hi to you. You're always uh, trying to get on my live streams. I'm really glad that you got to finally get on one and uh, glad to see you. Frequent commenter on the channel. Thanks for showing up, buddy. Um, so look, let's talk about what is the big deal with Didi. The big deal with Didi uh, and you know their stock went public on, uh, you know, on US exchange here just a couple of weeks ago. And within a few days, Chinese regulators had slapped a ban on downloading their app um, from you know the, the Chinese app stores uh, had downloaded them from or prevented them from accepting new uh, clients, and they started this investigation. Now, a lot of folks are a little bit confused on what that investigation entails. What the Chinese regulators are investigating is the structure that allows Chinese companies to go public on U.S. exchanges, and what that says about disclosure requirements and accounting requirements that their own government requires. Um, so there's a couple of things we should we should go, uh, talk about here uh, before we go specifically into the DD case. And number one is that you know this law or this regulation that was passed uh, back in, 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 uh, in, I think it was December of 2020, where it's finalized, basically stated that Chinese companies have three years to get right with regulators in the US when it comes to, um, when it comes to accounting standards, when it comes to reporting. And for some reason, and I don't know why this is, maybe someone can enlighten me, that the Chinese government has long treated the financials of Chinese companies, publicly traded companies, both in China and in the United States, has long treated their financials like state secrets for reasons that are really kind of kind of beyond me. Uh, so I know some people are going to say, oh, it's so they can hide fraud. I don't necessarily believe that. I don't think that every Chinese company out there is a fraud, uh, even though many of the ones that that went on U.S. exchanges back in like the 2010, 2013 era um, uh, through reverse merger, those were definitely frauds. Lots of them were frauds. But in this case, I, I don't necessarily think so. I think so. Um, there are plenty of ways to commit fraud while having great, while having, while adhering to our financial standards here in the U.S. That happens all the time as well, right? So what is under attack here is the deal structure that many companies, including some of our, 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 you know, our most famous companies that we deal with here on U.S. exchanges like Neo, Xpeng, and uh, you know, Tencent, and Alibaba, all those companies, they have these arrangements where they're established in mainland China. They form a shell company in Hong Kong, which in, which in turn owns another shell company, usually in some other tax-friendly place like the Cayman Islands or or uh, or something like that. And actually, UAE is another one of those very friendly places that's starting to show up more and more um, in, in some, small, some of these smaller IPOs. So that structure is, um, is basically kind of under attack at this point. So uh, China is pushing hard for that digital yuan. Uh, I, I'm not sure that's clear yet. Just because they're attacking Bitcoin doesn't necessarily mean they're gunning for a digital yuan at this point. But um, I actually don't see a problem with that. Um, anyhow, what does it say about listing 
companies on U.S. exchanges. So they're saying the Chinese regulators right now are giving us indications that that particular business structure where you have a shell company owned by a shell company owned by a shell company, which essentially is going to allow Chinese companies to sort of skirt Chinese rules when it comes to disclosures and get right with U.S. Uh, exchanges when it comes to uh, quarterly reporting, disclosures, and financials, that would allow them to be compliant. Whereas, you know, Chinese government does not want them to be compliant with generally accepted accounting standards, does not want them to be compliant with all of their filings and all that. Like I said, I don't know why they've constantly treated this as a state secret, but the Chinese government has, and they've done this for two decades now. Um, I, I expected this to be resolved professionally and amicably around a negotiating table. That's not, I'm not saying that they're, it's not going to be at this point. They definitely could be. But to the Chinese government is taking the harder line on this business structure than I thought. And there may be a couple of reasons behind that. Um, Xpeng's, they uh, Xpeng recently floated shares on the Hong Kong exchange. And that was actually a spectacular, spectacular success. They raised somewhere north of $1.8 billion. The offering was massively oversubscribed. And I'm wondering right now, if the CCP is beginning to believe that it's time to decouple our capital markets to a degree. And I'm wondering if it's time, uh, if they think that it's time uh, or that their markets are essentially integrated enough and mature enough to where most companies can actually go after funding inside of China and raise the kind of money that they could with US IPO. I'm wondering if that's the case. When I started though, looking at the numbers involved in some of these companies that are going public on the Shanghai exchange, some of these public are, you know, are companies that are going public on the Hong Kong exchange, the numbers are actually pretty large there too. So I'm not really sure what's going on there, um, but this push is nothing new. There's been constant, constant scrutiny in China with some of these deals. Uh, they tend to frown on financial innovations for one reason or another. I, I don't really know why, but I'm finding it very interesting. So I don't think that Didi is going to be the only company that is investigated in this respect. Something that they said very clearly, though, is they're looking to make this uh, sort of arrangement not possible in the future, meaning that in order to go public on a U.S. exchange, on a US exchange you would have to first satisfy all the requirements to go public on a Chinese exchange. And that's kind of one of the things like Didi could have never gone public on a Chinese exchange. They've been around for 11 years and haven't made a profit at all, right? Um, that that sort of uh, restriction doesn't exist in the United States. You don't have to be profitable to go public. And there are numerous different ways you can go public here in the US, um, but they have those sort of restrictions on China. At least that was my understanding of, of the article that I was reading on this. But yeah, I think that uh, I think that going forward, we're gonna see more and more of these regulations we are going out of these investigations. We're probably going to see the Chinese government come out and say that these types of arrangements are gone forever. And I think we're going to see more companies that are already listed here in the US have dual listings, both on US exchanges and on uh, exchanges in, in China. So those are just some of the thoughts that were going around my head today regarding what's going on between, uh, you know, between with, with Chinese delisting. Now, the question that a lot of people are going to be asking, of course, is whether or not I should be dumping some of my Chinese stocks, whether that's Tencent or Alibaba or Neo or um, you know or whatever it is. Um, I say that you need to figure. Political risk should have always been a part of your calculation, right? Uh, it should have always been a part of your calculation, and you should always limit your bets in in countries that don't have the sort of don't have the solid processes in place that are going to prevent sort of shock decisions. The reality is the CCP can make any decision they want to because um, just because of the, the way they operate and the public will accept that. You know, that's not necessarily the case here. We have institutions and processes uh, that have to be followed and regulations that have to be followed. They can make them up as they go along. And um, I think that's one of the big, big things that you should have always considered as a factor when investing in China. I have plenty of investments in China. I have a pretty significant investment, for me at least, in NEO, a slightly smaller one in Xpeng. I'd, like, I'd love to have more Xpeng. Um, but beyond that, I really don't own more than token shares in other companies like Alibaba and Tencent. I kind of wish I owned more Tencent. Um, but yeah, so I'm, a little, I'm having a little bit of an issue right now diving a little bit deeper into the Chinese stock market because everything that I own that's also an American company that is also you know, traded on US exchanges, 
they all they all have this huge tie to China as well for manufactured goods, for raw materials, whatever it is. So our economies are are intertwined and linked in a way in which they can't really be extricated. We're going to have to find some sort of reasonable solution for the dispute that's going on right now. So I'm limiting further exposure to China, right? And I love a number of Chinese stocks. I love BYD company. I absolutely love NEO. I love Xpong. I'm probably a bigger fan of Xpong. Lee is in there as well. I just don't own a lot of their shares anymore. They got called away and I didn't find a good price to, to buy back in. So, um, yeah. So anyway, if you guys want to talk anything right now, ask questions, super chat fun as well. I'm willing to entertain questions on anything related to finance. Let's avoid though. Um, that's one of the things I don't do on my channel. If you guys notice, I have a different background today because I'm not at home. I'm on vacation at my father's place uh, on the East Coast. So I'm on different times. I think it's the first time I've done a live stream uh, actually while, you know, during market hours. But yeah, so uh, Nicholas says, any thoughts on Alibaba? Beyond what I covered right now, I don't have a ton of a ton of thoughts on it. It's a great business. I love where they're going in terms of their investments in in, uh, in AI. Uh, I love what they've done in terms of developing their their business inside of China. I think it's amazing. Um, but that's a stock that I would rather hold through a mutual fund anyway. And you do with or, or any or ETF or something like that. When you do, when you have uh, because it's essentially an Amazon at this point. It, it's so it's so large. It's so well covered. There's so much public information out there that I don't think there's an opportunity to sort of outsmart the market in that case. Um, but yeah. So uh, Mavericks Abor says, what is your take on the current inflation fear? Are tech stocks set to rebound in the second half? Well, tech stocks have already rebounded quite a bit uh, from their lows just a month or so ago. Um, and I think we should all admit at this point that uh, that the valuation of tech stocks is, is it's, it's always difficult. You're pricing in future growth. You're pricing in innovation that hasn't happened yet. So using words like like undervalued, overvalued in terms of a tech stock or or a little uh, ridiculous at some point. Like if you looked at Amazon at any point in the first 20 years of its history, you could have said that it was overvalued, right? Um, they had they never showed up any sort of profit whatsoever. All their money was poured back into R and D or expansion of their operations, and you could have said that this is a company that for 20 years wasn't profitable, right? So when you're looking at tech stocks, that's always some consideration that you have to make. Um, was Neo potentially overvalued at $63 a share sometime back in January? I, I think that it was, right? Uh, was Xpong overvalued at $74 a share or whatever the high that it hit uh, back in that time frame? I, I think that it was as well. Um, are they right now still overvalued at right around $42, $40 a share? Based on your traditional metrics, of course they are overvalued. Based on how much market share I think that they're going to own of the Chinese electric or the Chinese vehicle market period in the next ten years, I think they're woefully undervalued in the case of Xpong, and I think they're a little bit undervalued in the case of Neo at this point. So, um, are tech stocks set to rebound? Like I said, I think that they have rebound to a degree, and they they had overrun uh, overrun what they were worth to a bit earlier this year. So <clears throat> any thoughts on Voyager uh, VGX? Uh, not something that I am uh, covering right now. It's not something I've taken a look at. So Min Tran, welcome back, buddy. You are a frequent commenter on my live streams and on my videos. Are, uh, he says, are there genomic stocks that you that uh, interest you? Uh, there's plenty of them that interest me. And Well, let me put it to you this way. I'm far more interested in the technology itself than I am in individual companies in that space. Uh, someone just pointed out uh, in my Patreon group today a, a really good article uh, with these new uh, with these new basically snippets of DNA that folks are looking at called Borgs. This is basically in research stage. This was a scientific article that was published. I read the entire article and not sure I, I understand all of the implications at this point. I'm going to take a week or two to digest that. But essentially it has to do with being able to uh, handle greenhouse gases using these strips of DNA and microbes to do it, right? So this all has to do with things that we, which are biological solutions to really huge problems that we have today. And this is one of those fields I think is going to absolutely explode in the next 10 years. This is one of those one of those things I'm absolutely 100% on board with Kathy Wood when she says that this sector is going to 50x or 200x in the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, Min Tran, thank you so much for um, for your super chat contribution. 
Thank you so much. Right. Um, so I think that uh, I absolutely agree with her when it comes to the sector itself being worth 50 to 200 times more in the future. And I think we have no idea where this is going to go. And this is truly a, a sort of science fiction world we're, we're entering into right now with, with in this field and in a couple of other fields, but particularly in genomics, the possibilities for treatment of, of various genetic diseases out there are absolutely enormous. Something like one third of all deaths that occur every year in the United States have an underlying genetic component to them, meaning it's essentially a software software error, right? Your uh, your DNA is essentially a, an operating system and application layers on top of that, and uh, it's riddled with errors. Your DNA essentially is not this perfect machine that many people want you to believe it is. It looks more like Windows 3.11 with 35 years of random software updates and, and your grandma clicking on, on, on every special offer and catching every computer virus that ever existed, right? That is essentially your DNA, my DNA, everyone's DNA on the planet. There's a lot to discover there. There are a lot of errors in that process. And there's, like I said, most, not most, but at least a third of all deaths in the United States can be attributed in some way or, or uh, genomics has some sort of contribution to uh, to that death, right? So we have a lot to do in this case. So I think that the possibilities when you're looking at CRISPR's uh, gene editing technology, where you're taking a process derived from a microbe and using that to insert or delete specific gene sequences in a living creature, I think that's an application that we may not see maturity on for a very, very long time. And it may, it may turn out that even CRISPR, the Cas9 process, may not be the ultimate process that we use. Uh, I just think we are just beginning, just beginning in this truly space age technology. I think is absolutely incredible. Uh, so John in Mimi's Journey says, what is the impact to the share price of any when, con when Chinese companies have dual listings? Does each carry its own share value or is it collective as a whole? So ostensibly, there should not be a difference uh, in share prices. And if you, and, but there always is, uh, there's always, I, in fact, that you speak, I think that used to be called like market arbitrage. I, I don't remember what the old term was, but there actually used to be an entire process of trading the difference between stocks that were traded on, say the New York uh, exchange and the Chicago exchange. Sometimes there was a price difference so you could exploit that. The same thing has gone on for years between U.S. exchanges and Hong Kong, Hong Kong exchanges with those companies that were dual listed and something like Hong Kong exchanges and London exchange. That process has gone on forever. Generally, the difference in prices doesn't last very long. Like you're looking, if you're looking at BD, uh, like uh, BYD, right? Uh, BYDDF and BYDDY, one of them represents uh, eight shares at like 10 to one and one of them or whatever the number is. And one of them represents ADRs. So there's a there's an actual like multiplier effect between it. It's the the different they should always be. I don't remember the exact number, so please don't quote me on this. I think that one of them should always be about four times higher than the other one, right? Um, Sometimes because one of them represents like one share and one of them represents like four shares or something like that. Uh, but there is a price difference between the two at a time. Uh, the market doesn't treat it like it should though in terms of dilution. Uh, when Xpeng sold 1.8 billion shares uh, on the Hong Kong exchange, that really represented dilution. And the market certainly didn't treat it that way. They treated it like it was a holiday. So, um, yeah, I don't uh, I don't see any, any I, 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 I don't see why the market doesn't treat them differently, because it was uh, definitely dilution there. Um, Rich Mukasa. You know what, I'm Mitch, Rich, we're going to talk about Neo probably several times in this uh, in this uh, live cast. We, we kind of addressed it earlier. My opinion on Neo hasn't changed. My discomfort with owning Neo stock right now has more to do with political risk and nothing to do really with, with the company at this time. Uh, I think uh, like I'm all positive right now. There's a number of hedge funds, though, that have been decreasing their holdings in Neo. I don't know if that's a short-term trade based on the pop they got from Neo Day and, and, and good earnings. I don't know if that's fear of the listing, but there are also a number of significant hedge funds that added this as well. So uh, Loki Bentley says, any change to your outlook on SoFi? So Loki, um, I'm actually, I, I own a lot of SoFi, probably more than would make a lot of people comfortable. I don't necessarily own this because I see this company like taking over the fintech space. I really don't. Uh, fintech is going to be a world in which the winner simply takes the most rather than everything. Um, 
And I, I think that SoFi is set up because of their unique, it's not a necessarily unique ecosystem there, but they're set up to do quite well uh, within their market, especially when it comes to cross-selling. They have extremely profitable relationships with their high earner, not well served market. Um, and they, they have in their call deck, which I covered in one of my videos, I went over their whole market, how they target them, how they cross sell to them, and that most of the relationships they have with clients are, are, um, are multi-client relationships. The drop in the stock price right now, I, I'm not going to lie, it's concerning, especially because I own so much of the stock. But it doesn't seem to be based on any news whatsoever. Not a lot has come out about this company that hasn't been really positive. But there's just not a lot of news, period. They haven't even really reported uh, their first. They haven't made their first post-IPO quarterly earnings report. But I expect to see good things in those. How does inflation affect or rising interest rates affect financials, though? especially since they are completing the process of obtaining their bank charter and they've actually acquired a small bank. They acquired a, a small deposit based on that, but that's not, they really did that to accelerate the process of getting their bank charter done. Uh, higher interest rates and higher inflation only benefits the bank in this case. Um, and uh, when you see, whenever you have higher interest rates, you start to see a spread growth between what you pay, what you get paid for deposits uh, and what you have to pay when you take out a loan, the the spread on that increases, as does the risk to a degree. But banks tend to make more in, in rising income environments. And they have a lot of different lines of, um, uh, of, of profit, too. So right now, they still make most of their money. I think it was 83 84% of their money is made uh, from their loan portfolio. Mostly, they're, they're refinancing student loans, of, of private student loans. In the future, though, we're going to see a more diverse income stream from this company as uh, they start making money from trading, they start making money from order direction, they start making money from all of the other services that they offer. And they do offer uh, myriad services to, uh, you know, and I'm even looking at some of their services as a business owner, someone who owns multiple businesses, I'm having a little bit of trouble right now, um, sort of organizing everything that I want to see in terms of transaction flow on like one computer screen. And, um, and I'm trying to learn how to do this through my phone as well. Like doing, uh, most phone apps are not really set up very well to manage multiple businesses, and that's one of the things I'm hoping that lo that uh, that lo um, that SoFi is is going to come up with. But their business services are starting to become more mature as well. Um, but yeah, so and one of the other things I noticed, possibly because I research this all the time, I'm starting to see more and more advertisements for different um, for different SoFi services. Probably because I, I kind of hit their target market as well, which is educated income at a certain level um, and, and, and probably not well served by traditional banking institutions. If you're getting ads by SoFi, I think that they're probably highly targeted and that's kind of the, the, the group that you're in too. It, but the it, it's not fun to watch their, their stock go from $22 a share down to $15 and something a share. I'm not planning to sell anything right now. I bought a little bit more right around like $17.90. Uh, I'm on vacation right now, but I'm still thinking about buying a little bit more in this case. I think that as they start to report quarterly earnings and as time goes on, they're going to be a, a steady performer, meaning that in the future, I expect somewhere between 10 to 15 percent consistent annual returns on the stock. Over time, you're going to see the power of compound earnings. And I think that when I retire in just in just 10 years or so, this is going to be one of the largest holdings in my portfolio and one of the largest sources of income that I have. So. Um, no, my outlook on SoFi hasn't changed. I'm still enormously positive on them, uh, largely because, like I said, I've worked in finance for a long time. They do what uh, we were always taught to do uh, as a sort of holy grail of customer relationships, which is to create that really sticky relationship with multiple lines of business. It makes it very hard for them to leave. So, um, Mintran says, can you uh, please explain FIFO first in, first out, and how it could trigger a wash deal when buying stocks at different prices and then selling and buying again. So uh, first in, first out. So when you go to sell something uh, through your app and or sell something through you know, TD Ameritrade or Fidelity, and actually you don't have this option to, to select what tax treatment you want with all of the different apps. Sometimes like I like to sell highest cost first to keep my, transact, my, my uh, taxable transaction uh, as low as possible, right? Uh, and that's that's just a personal preference of mine. I don't want to be pushed into a, and I, I don't want to be pushed anywhere. I don't want to be pu pushed, right? Um, but how can it trigger a wash sale? 
essentially you have to be reminded of the 30 day rule when it comes to sales in the US, meaning that if you were to sell NEO stock, uh, you know, if you bought NEO stock at, at, at $43 a share or something like that, and it dropped to $25 a share and you decided to sell then, in order to actually realize that loss, you have to wait 30 days to get back into that stock, right? Um, and if you get back into that stock within 30 days, uh, then you would not be able to realize that loss. It's considered what's called a wash sale, meaning um, you, you, you realize the loss, but you don't get to use it on your tax return to take that, uh, th that deduction against any other gains you may have made. Not only that, if you enter into a substantially similar stock in that 30-day window, it may also trigger a wash sale. Now, I haven't seen this happen for quite some time, and I've only seen this happen with like high net worth individuals who are doing some uh, doing a lot of trading, high volume trading. So they must have caught the attention of the IRS or something like that. Or people who had previously been audited. Um, but say you bought Neo at sixty dollars a share, it dropped to forty two dollars a share, and you have a huge gain in another stock somewhere else. Maybe it's uh, I, I don't know what it is, but you decide to sell that stock. But within the next 30 days, without thinking about it, you go out and buy x -Bong at, at, at $50 a share and it goes back up and NEO goes back up. At the end of the year, the IRS may decide that this was a wash sale because x -Bong was a was a substantially similar enough stock. Um, now, I don't know that that's the case, but that could be the case. This is something that I actually have seen in practice over the last 15 years a couple of times. Most of the time it's been with very frequent traders who are extremely uh, high net worth, okay? So uh, yeah, that's one of the ways it could trigger a wash sale, uh, even when you're buying a different, different uh, even if you're buying them in different accounts, meaning you sell them in a brokerage account and then you buy it in an IRA account, that can also trigger a wash sale. It kind of, it, it said, it just depends on whether or not you're catching the attention of, um, of uh, the IRS. So David R says, excellent insight. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know if I've ever seen you comment on my channel before, David R, but thank you. Patrick Dillon says, what is your outlook on Apex Clearing? I, eventually, I, I believe you mentioned them as a potential unicorn in the past video. I did. Um, so I like some of these sort of uh, stories of back-end players in industries um, that really do really, really well. I'm talking about um, the sort of pick and shovel type investments in a gold rush, right? So in the gold rush in, in, in 1848, most gold miners went broke, right? But people who sold, sold them picks and shovels did fairly well. Maybe they didn't hit it big and make a billion dollars, but they made a couple million, right? Uh, I think that's going to be the case somewhere with the EV industry. I think just like the uh, internal combustion industry, 99% of companies are actually going to go out of business and, you're, and you have to look for a way to profit from the EV revolution, which is happening right now. It is undeniable. It's going to happen right now. Um, and you have to look for a way to profit from that no matter what happens with any individual company. I think lithium mining is one of those good cases out there. Uh, cobalt mining outside of politically uh, problematic areas and manganese mining would be one of those ways to, uh, to, to sort of tap into that. And there's a few other ways to do that as well. Uh, when it comes to uh, FinTech though, uh, Apex Clearing and so far they have, uh, not Apex Clearing, they have Galileo services and all that. Uh, so Galileo services provides API through SoFi to connect other FinTech apps to the financial world. And it makes it super easy to do it. I mean, I was reading about their API and it's just dead simple to get the access you need to financial networks to design an app to do what you wanted to do and you can make the API dance, right? That's one of those things that is with, with that, that I have a lot of faith with SoFi um, when, when it comes to expanding their lines of business. And they're, I think they're going to grow that revenue stream to it becomes a really significant portion of their business. Galileo is already profitable. I think that profit is only going to grow as more and more companies start creating these fintech apps. They're not going to redevelop the API they need in order to connect to the financial world. They're going to use what's already out there. You're not going to reinvent the wheel every time you write an app. They're not going, and, and that's kind of where I see their future. I see the same thing with Apex Clearing. Apex Clearing for a while has been the clearinghouse for fintechs, right? For a while, they were the clearinghouse for Robinhood before they started to go out on their own. They are the clearinghouse for Webull. They are the clearinghouse for half a dozen other apps that you may or may not know, but they are doing a ton of business out there. And I think that this is another one of those companies that is absolutely unspectacular. Right now with the major wirehouses, you, you basically have, well, the major uh, like brokerage firms out there, you have National Financial, 
you have LPL and you have like Pershing Capital and a couple of other firms that really own that entire industry. They don't do anything but custodian trades and they make a small percentage of whatever trade is done on their system. And uh, they make tons of money doing this. And I, and that's sort of one of the back end things of the finan financial industry that you never think about. You, you never think about this. But um, for example, if you um, were, if there's a number of companies out there also that you think are independent trading houses that actually um, custodian all of their trades through national financial. Something like one out of six transactions in the United States goes through uh, national financial, which is owned by Fidelity. Uh, I think that Apex Clearing has a chance of kind of being that um, that sort of back end custodian for, uh, for for most of fintech, and I think that uh, Galileo Services inside of SoFi has a chance of being. I don't think they'll be the largest, but I think they'll be a significant player in that business as well. Um, but yes, um, okay. And Loki Bentley says. What about your, or thank you for the detailed response. Nicholas, thank you so much for your super chat uh, donation. I really appreciate that. Uh, if you guys have any questions, fire away. I wanted to address an earlier question about, um, about inflation. So I've been in Southern California for the last for forever, essentially. Took my first vacation in a very long time, and now I'm on the East Coast, and I like to cook. I really like to cook. So I went to the grocery store a couple of times since I've been here, and I have to tell you that I am shocked by grocery prices here in South Carolina, in coastal South Carolina. It's actually higher than grocery prices right now in Southern California, which to me is stunning. The reverse has always been true. But in, particularly, in particular, produce prices are through the roof here. Uh, is this an indication of inflation or in, is this an indication of supply shock? Okay. So we've been through something. You never want to say something is exactly like it was in the past, but we're looking at a supply shock that looks a little bit like the early 70s. The response of the government in that time period probably created the conditions that necessitated uh, inflation, meaning they tried to impose price controls on certain things. And that, of course, caused a constriction in supply, which caused prices to go up even more on other things, right? Because no one wanted to overproduce anything because of the fear that the government was going to simply limit the price. So you didn't have new producers jumping in to produce new whatever was restricted because they knew that the price wasn't going to go up and they weren't going to be able to grab any of that. And that caused sort of inflation, uh, sort of runaway inflation over time that was only stopped by Paul Volcker in the early 1980s, absolutely against everyone in politics. Like uh, Paul Volcker saved the U.S. economy in the 19, uh, 1980s. Uh, and I can tell you, Ronald Reagan did not want him to crash the economy, which Paul Volcker did. Um, the Democrats did not want Paul Volcker to crash the economy, which he did. He raised interest rates up to 18% or something, deliberately caused an inflation, and used that as an opportunity to attract U.S. dollars back to the uh, United States. These were This is when everything was in physical dollars. And literally, they burned billions of dollars um, you know, through the tragedy, like literally just burned them, right? Today, you could do different things. You can keep them with a click of a button ones and zeros, you can eliminate a large part of the, the money supply. But back then, they actually had to get physical U.S. dollars that were in banks overseas, bring them back to the U.S. and and, and, and take that money uh, out of circulation, right? Things are different today. We have different control mechanisms and all that. But we're looking at an era where we're seeing these supply shocks right now. Global supply chains are not simple. It's not a matter of just saying, hey, let's start producing again. There's a lot that goes on there. It's a slow-moving beast these are, I, I keep thinking of in my mind, and maybe this is a really bad way of thinking, of like of like 100 mile long snakes. You know, a snake eats an egg, but it's 100 miles long. How long does it take to digest that egg? Uh, and, and, and supply lines are kind of like that too. They're far more delicate and interwoven systems than we thought they were prior to the pandemic. And I think the pandemic sort of exposed a lot of that. I do think a lot of this is supply shock. Some of our most common items where we know that other producers are going to jump in are going to come down fairly soon. We've already seen that happen with uh, with lumber futures. Lumber futures basically have crashed by about 40% in the last month and a half or so. It's essentially the largest crash in, month in, in lumber futures that ever happened. And yet the price of lumber at Home Depot really hasn't come down that much. I was trying to get, uh, you know, I finished building one boat in, as a hobby and I'm starting on another one. And I was just kind of planning out how much it was going to cost. I went to Home Depot and I'm seeing sheets of plywood at four times the price that I bought them 
you know, a year and a half ago. So I am uh, not going, I'm basically going to delay building that boat. So there's no demand coming for me now for those sheets of plywood. And eventually that's going to happen. Either they're going to overproduce or demand is going to slow down for certain products. And we'll see that come. As long as the government doesn't step in and interfere with the free market, I think that this inflation is transitory. It's, we're going to see significant inflation for almost everything until the end of the year or so. And then most things will decline in price, except perhaps some of the things that were probably underpriced to begin with. I'll tell you one thing that I don't see happening again. One thing that I don't see going back to normal. I don't see an era of us going back to norm, going back to where people earn minimum wage and work three jobs, three part-time jobs, you know, 60 hours a week at three different part-time jobs. So everyone can avoid paying the benefits for minimum wage at $7 and 75 cents an hour. I don't see that happening again. Uh, one of the added benefits of all the pandemic assistance is that people got a chance to reevaluate their lives and, and think again, think again about how they wanted to live. And I think that, you know, that, that sign that went viral where everyone at the Burger King quit, I just saw the sign, didn't read anything about the reasoning, but I think more of that is coming. Um, and you know, I, I tell people all the time, like I, there's a 16 year old girl that works for me. She has a specific job to do at one of my businesses and she made some, uh, sort of commission incentive for her to do more business and earn more. I have zero problem paying a 16 year old that because she produces more business. Right. And I think that, that as an employer, I, I, it, it's in my best interest to have her, to train her to do really, really well to train her to be a good worker, train her to think on her own and to pay her well enough to where she doesn't take those job skills to someone else. So employers have had this law, employers for a long time have had this leg up on employees saying, if you don't like it, leave. That script has flipped at this point. It's not necessarily a bad thing, right? So I don't want to delve into politics here, but I think that most of the lower half of income earners in the United States need to make more money. Why? Why, why is that? I want them as customers for my businesses. That's why, right? I don't want to see, and it, it seems like for my businesses that I own, my customer base has been shrinking over the years, uh, not because I'm a jerk or anything like that, because literally there aren't enough people who earn enough money to afford my services. I want to widen out my customer base and everything. So I, I'm actually, I actually think this is a good thing. I'm willing to pay more if I want to go eat fast food because those workers make $15 an hour or whatever they decide to make minimum wage. Uh, I'm willing to pay more. And and I can tell you, uh, I used to pay someone at this the, for this girl that I pay like $17, $18 an hour, depending on what her commission schedule was like. I used to pay someone $11 an hour to do it. Uh, and I didn't get as good quality of work out. And that's still way above minimum wage when I do um, And this is a small business. And not only that, her check, the checks are a lot bigger, but the impact on my bottom line in business is has actually been positive. Uh, because I have, they're, they're more motivated. And I think that and more and more employers are actually going to see that. Treat your employees like human beings. Um, give them an opportunity to move up. Give them uh, it said the opportunity to improve their skill set. And I think you're going to see that every it works out better for everyone. Loki Bentley, uh, I wanted to say thank you very much for your super chat contribution. I try to give detailed answers to all the questions that are answered on here, but I wanted to thank you very much for that super chat contribution. Um, so John, oh, so Anvar says, Jason, heard of the DCRC ticker, uh, solid power. It seems that they, they have a commercially ready solid state battery, years ahead of QuantumScape, and uh, they do alternative green power systems for buildings, commercial, et cetera. I think I have heard of this. I think uh, back when I went on my, my QuantumScape rant, rant some months ago, someone sent me an article on them and I started reading. I don't know that their solid state battery is commercially available either. Um, there's two companies in China that I'm thinking of that both claim to have not just solid state uh, batteries ready for commercial application, but they also claim to have scaled production. They made these claims six months ago, and now I've heard nothing about them. And the speculation has been that NEO was paired up with one of these kind of startup companies. But then I haven't seen anything published in terms of white papers, and I haven't seen anything published in terms of patents uh, regarding certain issues with solid state batteries, specific chemical issues with solid state batteries. Everyone keeps saying these problems are going to be solved. These problems are going to be solved. Um, I, I like leaks. Leaks are generally an indication that uh, something real is going on. Scientists in academia 
basically their medium of exchange in academia is not actually money. It's, it's prestige and it's publishing, right? So what they produce is, is, is published information. And basically they create their work. Um, they, they, when someone publishes a paper or an experiment or something like that, they create their work, they make it public. It goes out there for, for consumption. It passes peer review first. And then once it gets out there, every scientist on the planet is free to like pick it apart and destroy it or whatever. But if you know you're right, it's a huge feather in your cap. And really a lot of what drives the people and the personal motivation that drives people is, is, is whether, whether scientists want to admit it or not, it's public recognition of their success. Wow. You're such a smart guy. In that case, you're dealing with enormous egos when it comes to scientists that work for these companies and they want to keep things quiet until they publish, but they definitely want to publish, right? They definitely want to publish and they want to get their data out there and they want to tell everyone in the world that they were right. I'm not seeing any indication, like I said, that these key issues with solid state batteries have been solved at this point. So um, yeah, I am still not a fan of QuantumScape, largely because I, I think that I, I'm not sure that a state, a, a company at quantum stage, quantum scape stage of de development, really should have been allowed to go public. At the time they went public, they were probably four or five years away from an actual uh, a product that's available to the public. Like, and they're and I, I can guarantee you, not guarantee you, because I can't guarantee anything. But what's likely to happen is that they're going to produce a solid state battery for like a watch or a phone or something first, long before they ever get to a car, right? Um, and, but before they even do that, like I said, there's a technical hurdle that has to be solved. There's longevity testing that has to be done. I mean, they have to test this battery, you know, through, through thousands of cycles. What they've shown us so far was a battery that would be good for a hunt between like 180 and 240 cycles, right? At least that's what, I, that's the most current research that I read. And that was like three months ago, maybe something new has come out, but I, but I haven't seen it yet. But that's essentially no better than the current lithium ion batteries that we have on, um, that are commercially available today. The only difference is, is they're, they're, they're significantly safer. There's a lot less risk of fire, right? Um, but what we're looking for is batteries that cycle somewhere around 2,000 times, uh, you know, two to 4,000 times in order for them to be suitable for a car battery. That's essentially what we need. And we don't have those at this time. So I, I, I love the idea of a solid state battery. I love the idea of the safety of the solid state battery. I'm not seeing an indication that that technology is going to be ready for uh, volume. Or, you know, it's not going to be ready for another four years, and it's not going to be ready for volume production for another six to seven years, according to some of the scientists that I've spoken with. So uh, that's why I'm not going to invest in QuantumScape for quite some time. I said earlier that QuantumScape was a deal at under twenty dollars a share. I need to. I really need to backtrack on that. I'm kind of wrong about even that. It's a deal at under twenty dollars a share if they're somewhere near volume production, which they they are not. If four or five years from now they are at twenty dollars a share, I'd probably consider investing then. Um, but I don't necessarily think that they're even going to survive in their current form in the next four or five years. I think they'll get acquired by somebody, probably um, by one of the larger companies that invested in them. They, they want that technology if it's actually real. So. Um, uh, Raul Gill says DD. We covered DD earlier in the uh, live stream. When it's over, we can talk about that. The investigation of DD, like I said, is really about the structure, the business structure, and the nesting uh, business relationships that allow these companies to go public on US exchanges. That's what's under attack right now, not necessarily the company DD itself. Um, and China will probably end up banning companies from going public in the US in that manner in the future. Um, basically, Didi would never have been allowed to go public in uh, on Chinese exchanges because they haven't been profitable in the entire 11 or 12 years of their existence. Uh, and they can avoid that and go public on US exchanges using a variety of different methods. That's what's under attack, not really the company itself. So Eduardo Cantarero says, a star wants to see himself rise to the top. A leader wants to see those around him become stars. Awesome, you're taking care of your employee. Thank you so much. In fact, um, so I have, I, I've discussed this before. I have uh, basically a business development uh, company that I have with a couple of couple of other partners, and we help uh, entrepreneurs in the fitness industry, in plumbing, in uh, you know, and a couple of other related industries get started. And one of our goals is is that everyone has to make a living wage uh, that works for the company. And you would be surprised how many people think that's a crazy idea. Um, and, and, like it's absolutely insane. And so we are are perfectly willing to invest in businesses that have a much higher probability of success. And take a lower uh, a lower cut of the overall ownership 
as opposed to what a venture capital firm traditionally does, which is make tons of really high risk investments. 90% of them are going to fail. And you know, one of them is going to kind of make up for all those failures. We're approaching this from the opposite direction. We're opening up businesses and industries that we understand and we know, and that we have a higher degree of success, understanding that we're going to have lots of small successes rather than one big one, and we're going to have fewer failures. So that's kind of, but and one of the reasons we're successful is that everyone that we, we, we help start their own company ends up making a living wage very, very quickly. And uh, that's, I think that's kind of the difference is these business development corporations and venture and not necessarily business, but people who want to individually invest in businesses. If, let's say I put down 100% of startup expenses. I pay you, uh, you a base salary for six months until the business is profitable. In many cases, the people who made that initial investment, they want 50% of the profits forever. We don't do that. We have a different approach. So, um, do you know anything about a company called Electric Last Mile Solution in the U.S. competing with Workhorse for the Electric Van Last Mile Solutions? Actually, I, I don't. Um, that is that is a part of the EV market that I have not really explored. There's a lot to explore out there, folks. Um, there's plenty of it that I haven't explored. It's something that I know a lot of other people found exciting. Workhorse, as we know, they are, they're, they're in trouble at this point. They didn't get any of that uh, USPS contract. Looking back at it, the People who got the contract, uh, that was actually surprising in a couple of ways, but they are an experienced government contractor, uh, meaning they have experience bidding on contracts and they know how to negotiate that. Uh, my sister years ago uh, worked for Enterprise Rent-A-Car and they would they would provide, I don't know what exactly she did, but she got very good at bidding on, on contracts for Enterprise to provide services and equipment to the government. That's one of the ways they sort of got rid of their excess vehicles and things like that. She got very adept at this process where she knew when new people that came on and started bidding on contracts, they weren't going to get the contract simply because they couldn't speak the language. I don't know that this is the case with Workhorse, but it kind of seems like that was the case is they just weren't experienced enough or didn't hire someone who was experienced enough on bidding on uh, these contracts. So I do think that there's tons of business to be done in last mile delivery um, uh, type scenarios. Tons of business to be done with different companies and government agencies across the United States for someone to jump into this because Tesla has not created that. It's probably going to be on that Cybertruck frame and away from doing that. I think Workhorse still has a window for success with smaller contracts with different companies in the private sector, I think other companies have that window of success as well. Because you know, Canoe has their sort of uh, modular van uh, workhorse, and I, just off the top of my head, I can't remember. There's two or three other companies that are in this. I think Arrival is one of them, but they all have a shot at doing something like this. Um, so Patrick Dillon says, "How long do you think the chip shortage will last?" Well, Geely has already announced uh, Geely Auto in China, one of the largest auto producers that most people have never heard of. They've already announced that they expect the chip shortage to be at least their chip shortage to be done with sometime in late July. Uh, I, I would expect a lot of other EV producers are going to start making that announcement. Maybe they've cut some special deal with the devil. I don't know to get all of the, the chips that they need. Maybe not. Um, but it does look like the production is ramping back up. You shouldn't be listening to YouTubers when it comes to discussions on, on chips. You should be really looking at, at, people who are paid to be analysts of the chip industry, they, un they understand what's happening. We go through periodic chip shortages because managing the supply chain of chips has been uh, make or break for companies. Just for an example, when NVIDIA started as a GPU maker back in, I think, 1993, by 1997, they had 70 different competitor companies out there all making GPUs. By 2001, all of their competitors were dead or acquired, right? And they were the only standalone GPU company left alive. Uh, I went back and I did sort of an analysis on the industry and it looks like in one way or another, every one of those companies got caught out in terms of being able to supply um, demand for their product or being oversupplied and watch the price for the product drop like a rock. Right? No one is able to, to negotiate that path. So negotiating that path, because this is a commodity that rises and, and drops in price, um, being able to negotiate that path is the secret to success for all of these chip manufacturers. And I, I think we're, we're seeing that they made a bet that chip, the need for chips were, was wrong. They made the wrong bet that the need for chips is going to be depressed for years. They shut down a lot of production facilities. They're slowly bringing those back on or working as quickly as they can to bring those back on right now. But it's not as simple as flipping a switch, turning on the lights and inviting all the workers back in. 
Now, a lot of those workers moved on to different jobs. A lot of them, new people have to be trained. Uh, a lot of new facilities have been mothballed and shuttered for years um, and, or for, for months. And there's a lot that goes on with restarting this. I was under the wrong impression that this is going to be easy as well, too. So I, I was wrong about that. Uh, Jonathan, what's up, buddy? Haven't seen you in a while. Uh, we got to do another, uh, you know, I think for the Patreon group, we're going to do a, a beer and stock talk um, uh, Zoom meeting like we did earlier this year. And uh, this time we're not going to leave Adam being the only person drinking beer during our, our uh, stock talk. But we're going to do that through um, our Patreon group sometime in the next couple of weeks. All right. Um, but you say no offense to QS, a multi-billion dollar valuation without a product until 2025 seems unsound. I think it's entirely unsound. I agree with you. That was the whole point I was saying. Um, but I don't think you have to worry about offending QuantumScape, their, their company, not a person. But that brings me to one of the things I've been encountering a lot lately. Um, I can't remember what company I criticized recently. Uh, oh, it was um, uh, it was Lordstown. Man, you would not believe the hate mail I got from people because I said Lordstown was going to have a hard time accessing capital markets. They're going to have a hard time doing secondary offerings and they're going to have, have a hard time issuing bonds because they, would, they wouldn't be able to find anyone to underwrite the bonds. And they were dependent on a rich benefactor or private equity to help them make that make it over the hump. If you read their June press release where they basically, or their June, uh, uh, when they reported their financial um, the position where they basically said, hey, we're in trouble as a going concern, we might not be able to make it and we might not even be able to start production. If you weren't concerned with, with that, then man, you've got issues because this was a this was a clear warning sign that the company itself put out back in June, okay? The amount of hate mail that I got from that was absolutely unbelievable. Uh, guys, don't be emotional about the companies that you're investing in. Like the business of business is business. It's making money, right? As you as an investor, you're primary objective should be making money. Now you can use the money you have to promote the values and the outcomes you want in the world. Like I invested in Tesla uh, because I like the idea of, of electric vehicles. I don't, even, I don't even think I necessarily bought into the vision of the future where uh, into a carbon neutral future that, 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 that Elon Musk was trying to sell at that time. I bought it because I thought that electric vehicles were friggin' cool, right? There's nothing saying you can do that. But when that company starts to fall apart, and many of them will, you should really look at this rationally. And someone saying that they don't like this company and they give you three, four reasons why, maybe you should pay attention to those reasons rather than attacking them personally. Um, because it's it's not in your best interest to be emotional about any company that you're investing in. It's just a company. It's not a person. And it doesn't love you back. It doesn't love you back. Like I have this irrational uh, desire to buy a Tesla for my next car because Tesla has made me so much money over the years. It's an irrational desire to do that, right? Um, if there's a better car out there than a Tesla electric car, by the time I decide to go buy uh, an electric car, I should buy that other car rather than Tesla. But I have this irrational attachment to Tesla stock. This irrational att attachment to Tesla as a company. And I want to support them because they made so much money for me in the past. They don't know that they need so much money. They're not loyal to me. They don't care. It doesn't, it's just a company, guys. So um, anyway, that, that that's where I wanted that. So great insight on solid state, Jason. QS versus, uh, oh yeah, so thank you, Anbar. So do you think Atari will be ne will be the next GameStop? Man, I have no idea. Uh, I think that trying to predict what uh, Wall Street Bets is going to do is kind of a loser's game right now. <laughs> You're always going to lose out. Uh, Man, there are actually some brilliant people in, in at least eight months ago. There were some really, truly brilliant people in the Wall Street Bets subreddit who uh, had some really solid reasoning on a lot of things, not just GameStop. And I, I think that a lot of those people that were involved in that original group, and, and there's a lot of like angsty um, on the spectrum sort of uh, rants that are, that are going on in there. And, and I think that these people feel... Uh, quite a bit alienated by the way society works. But I have to say that I was actually pretty impressed by the intellectual um, musings of some of these folks. And of course, some of them were just downright crazy. But I think trying to predict what Wall Street bets is going to do is going to be really, really difficult. Uh, King Carlo Basio says, serious question. If Neo would be an American company, am I stupid and are crazy enough to think it would be almost $100 a share right now? 
I, I don't know that, that that's necessarily true, that they would be $100 a share. If they were an American company, then they would be, it would be based on what we, the amount of market share we expect them to grab in the American market. Um, I think that part of the valuation of, of NEO right now is anticipating that they're going to have a much larger share of a much larger market, right? They might end up with somewhere between 10 and 15% of uh, a market in China in 2050 that sells 50 million vehicles. Right now they sell about 22 to 24 million vehicles a year. They might sell up to 50 million vehicles a year um, by 2050. So I think that that's part of what people are looking at is how much the market, is, the market itself is going to grow. How many more people in China are actually going to be dragged into the middle class and they're going to be able to afford a vehicle of some sort. And, and that's already happening. Like people are buying the Wuling Mini EV, uh, which is a little tiny vehicle made by, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a GM joint venture there. It's the best-selling electric vehicle in China. Um, they sold something like 30,000 or 50,000. It was a ridiculous amount last month. It was, it was absolutely amazing. So um, Jonathan, uh, which I can't pronounce your name, dude. I'm sorry. <laughs> like I said, you've been on... Uh, blows my mind how some retail folks just gloss over the going concern part of the disclosure. Absolutely blows my mind too. And like I said, the heat, the hate email that I got from people um, never seemed to address that. They never acknowledge the fact that when you look at their at, at their quarterly reporting, they directly address the fact that they don't have enough money to make it. They have um, I, I forget exactly. I think they said like seven hundred million dollars on deposit or something like that. And they're only losing like $100 million a quarter. They're only losing $100 million a quarter right now because they're not in production. Um, and that and that's going to suck up a lot of the money, especially in terms of labor costs. Uh, so yeah, they have to find more money in order to go into production. Uh, and I, I don't necessarily see that happening, especially with what went on with their sort of verified orders deal. So um, Mido, seven, Mido says, Neil would have an even more unhealthy market in the US of being heavily invested in battery swapping, in my opinion. Um, actually, they're not as heavily invested in battery shopping as you might think. Remember that that operates as a as a as a uh, subsidiary that's partially owned by them, um, and and it's a subsidiary that if it collapses, it's not going to affect that much in terms of the bottom line for them. And I think I've just discussed this a lot of times that I like the way that they're at some point as range anxiety starts to decrease in China, as Chinese charging infrastructure catches up, as battery technology starts to uh, starts to increase, we may see that they stop making new battery swapping stations and they simply move, because they're all modular, they're all mobile, you can move them in a couple of days and get them hooked up. We'll see them move those battery swapping stations simply to new locations until charging infrastructure catches up and then they move them again. They're designed to be moved that way. So I, I've never thought that it was a permanent part of the strategy. It's a bridging strategy for not, and Neo saw this not just for them, but for everyone, it could be a bridging strategy. It also may end up being the, the way they provide batteries to other EV companies that want to produce their own EVs and still make that, um, uh, that, that limit for the subsidy. So the subsidy is really a financial innovation, not a technological innovation, that allows the uh, the electric vehicle to be affordable for a much larger slice of the population. And I think NEO may have a grand strategy of taking advantage of that financial innovation and regulation to do that. We have all kinds of industries here in the United States that are completely based on financial regulation or on industry regulations. Look at uh, smog testing in California. The only reason smog only stations uh, it exist is because the government mandates that you go get your, your car smogged every two years. And every couple of years, you have to go to a smog only station, right? Or if you're doing any kind of digging or building anywhere in the West, you have to have that essentially evaluated by an archaeologist, what's called a cultural resource management archaeologist. That's mandated by the government. It's an entire industry that exists simply because of regulation. This battery, not necessarily battery swap uh, service, but battery as a service managed by the battery asset company could end up being an entire industry that takes advantage of that financial innovation. And this may be a hard uh, subject to Matthew Parrish. Man, is that my brother on there? Uh, I don't know if that's actually my brother or just someone else who has to be, happens to be named Matthew Parrish. But, um, but yeah, it could be that to create a new industry for battery as a service, not just for Neo. But for all other manufacturers of, of vehicles in China that want to follow that NEO swapping standard, and they're trying to set that standard. I've been of that opinion since about October of last year, and that really hasn't changed, that 
Battery as a service and battery swapping is not supposed to be a core part of Neo's business model and not supposed to be a core driver of revenues that it's actually going to end up being a separate driver of revenues. And most of the clients will end up not being Neo. It'll end up being the hundred other manufacturers in China that pop up making electric vehicles and decide to adhere to Neo's uh, swapping standard, right? Oh, I guess it was my, uh, my brother. So, all right, I'll see you next week, Matt. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, do you see them coming out with their new investments? Something about 4,000 stations, the EO as well. I think that they were actually planning 1,000, 4,000 swapping stations in total. And it was 1,000 uh, swapping stations outside of uh, the US. And those are going to be in the EU. Uh, I do see that. I, I know that I don't know where you live, uh, you know, but in Europe, a lot more people live in flats. Uh, a lot more people live in older flats that probably don't have uh, the, the, the charging capabilities in place. And so swapping could make some sense there. But remember, swapping already failed with Better Place in, and they had they had uh, swapping stations here in California, or actually I'm not in California. They had them in California, they had them in Denmark, they had them in Israel. Israel would seem to be the prime test case for battery swapping. And it may be just a case where it was just too early for Better Place to make it uh, with battery swapping. Um, but Israel would be the prime case for that. A, a dense population, really small area, geographically limited with all of your main travel being done on, most of your travel being done on these like main thoroughfares and toll roads and things like that, where uh, you could have a limited amount of swap stations that would be able to service a really large fleet of vehicles, right? Should have been that, that test case for whether or not it would work. Norway is actually the same way. Like most of their major highways go up the, uh, up the coast. That's sort of, sort of like the central I mean, you have the southern part of the country that's highly, that's more densely populated. It's not, there's only like 10 million people that live there. And then everything else goes up, goes up the coast. It seems to be like the, the test case for battery swapping in Europe. Um, and I think Denmark will probably end up being next um, because of how they're arranged as well. So um, that's kind of my analysis when it comes to the battery swapping entity and battery as a service. I think that eventually ba all, everything battery related is going to be shoved into uh, the the uh, the uh, battery uh, entity. So I forget the name of it. So, um, all right. So they seem to have doubled down on the tech. You know, they filed, Neo filed a couple of patents on um, that I haven't gotten around to reading yet. They filed a couple of patents on on wireless charging for uh, a technology that could be seen as being used for wireless charging for vehicles too. So I haven't read those patents, so I don't know. I don't know how far along they are on that. It could be something really, really small. They're saying this could be uh, applied to you know, that in the future. Uh, Xpeng recently also filed some patents related to uh, EV drones, which I found, find pretty exciting. They're investing a lot. Xpeng is investing a lot in R&D. Neo is investing a lot in R&D. And uh, I think this is interesting. So, uh, Jason, you mentioned an entrepreneurial seminar or program. Could you provide me with more information? I'm not sure that's what I mentioned. I, I said I, I said I have a, a business development company that we 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 find entrepreneurs and help them start their own business. And we just started this here in the last year. We don't have like a seminar or program or anything. Right now we're so small that we're working with. I'm opening up another academy here pretty soon for uh, in the fitness business. We're opening up a plumbing place uh, later on in the year, uh, hydrojetting, and we're looking at an electrician as well. And we're looking at um, some, some things in CrossFit as well as like an F45 franchise as well. So I, I don't have like an entrepreneurial seminar program. We're looking for people who are experts in their field uh, who, are, who need seed capital and, and basically a base salary and benefits in order to be an entrepreneur. One of the big things that holds people back from starting their own business uh, is, is benefits, right? Uh, our medical system in the U.S. just sucks, right? And it actually inhibits entrepreneurialism. I pay... $1,281 a month for really terrible medical insurance because I'm 100% self-employed. We also maintain insurance in Japan and uh, where my wife is from. And if anything major goes wrong, I tell you, we were sending out people where I'll send my, my wife and my kids to Japan to get that done because the medical system there is just better. Uh, it costs less and you get more. And that's what most people don't realize about American. It, it, it's, it's not unpatriotic to say that we don't do everything perfectly. And medical is one of the things that we really don't do well at all. Most people are paying a lot and getting very little for their money and they don't even realize it. And when you attack our medical system, they take it as attacking our country rather than saying, hey, this is a product that isn't good and we can make it better, right? But the reality is we can't get better because of how our medical system is structured. So 
I wanted to create a way for people to start their own businesses and be able to have medical benefits as well through a corporate structure and be able to have like a base salary uh, because that's what prevents a lot of people from becoming business owners. And there's a lot of seriously talented people out there um, that can't make that leap because they can't take that risk. And I just don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's a calculation that millions of people make. There are lots of people that could go out and start their own business, but if they failed, it would mean that their family didn't have medical insurance or they would lose their house or something like that. Um, no, so I, I do see that, that there's an opportunity here and it's going to be fraught with problems. I know it is. I know that some of these businesses are going to fail. Some of these so-called entrepreneurs that we sponsor, they're going to be three months into it and they're going to abandon the business and I'm left holding the bag. I understand that's going to happen at some point, but this is mostly a way for us to make money, mostly, but it's also for a way, a way for us to create economic activity in our own communities, which is, I think, one of the things that we're, we're very, very excited about doing. So, um, hilarious to see DD in first truck alliance stocks rising, yet they cause a lot of Chinese stocks to go down massively. Yeah, I'm not actually looking at the market right now, um, but yeah, it does seem sort of like that. Um, that those are the stocks that people are jumping in the bottom fishing right now. Um, yeah, they're vulture investing. You know, they're, they're getting down right now. They think, see something that's beat up. They're buying it. Maybe they think there's going to be that 20% pop in the next couple of days and they're going to dump it. I don't think most of these people buying these stocks are like long-term investors. Um, when it comes to ride hailing services anyway, so I was not an investor in Lyft, not an investor in Uber, because looking at, just looking at their financials, they were a mess before they got started. I knew that there was going to be plenty of opportunity to invest in them as they got closer to profitability. Um, in that case, though, my deal with ride sharing and ride healing apps is what are they going to do when we actually reach autonomy for vehicles, right? Uh, if, if Tesla actually comes out with, with fully autonomous vehicles. And when I say fully autonomous vehicles, meaning that we don't have any of the issues that we have today. Uh, and let's be clear. It looks like, based on statistics, like you know, collisions per 100,000 miles uh, driven, it looks like that, uh, that, that AI-driven cars or autonomous driven cars are already better than humans. That's what it looks like from my, my very academic and mathematically oriented perspective. Uh, but I have taken a long trip in, in a self-driven car before, and there were a few things in it that were kind of odd that made it unpleasant to, to be in. But as these uh, problems are solved in the future, does a company like DD or Uber or Lyft have the future if those companies that already do like autonomous driving could just flip a switch and you could turn your car into a taxi while you're at work or at dinner or whatever, whatever it is, do they have a future if that happens, right? Um, or, or are they going to try and create an application layer for that? Because right now I can't put my own software on a Tesla. I can't put my own software on a Neo vehicle or on a, on a, um, on a VW vehicle, but it may be in the future that they, tr they treat, applications like this, like they were treated for uh, to run on top of uh, app or, uh, Apple or iOS or run on top of Windows or on Unix or whatever. It may be that they are forced to, through legal means, to open up and create an API, meaning that you'll own a car, an op not an open source vehicle, but something like an iPhone. Your car is essentially an iPhone and you can buy apps that are approved by the company to run on that, on that car, right? And maybe one of those is a right handling service from Uber but I, in that case, I think that Apple or Tesla or Neo or whatever would create their own or buy, a, acquire a company and just provide that with your vehicle. So I see, I see, I don't see sort of exponential Tesla-like returns for any of these ride-hailing services. I don't. I think that we're looking at something that's really interesting and really great, but it's a step towards something else that's even better. Um, and I and I just think that the money is not going to be in that type of investment, right? So uh, that, that's just my personal opinion though. Um, uh, personal opinions, like I said, even my personal opinion shouldn't be worth that much to you. You should really do your own research. Um, Eduardo says, thank you for the clarification. All right, guys, anything else you wanna ask? I am here and uh, I have time, but I, I think I told you guys at the beginning of the, uh, at the, the broadcast here that Super Chat features are on if you wanna use those. Also, at about 4.30 here, um, my dad wants to go on a pub crawl. It's something we do every time that I come here to visit him in his hometown. I think he likes to show me off. And uh, I definitely like hanging out with my dad and having a few drinks with him. He's a good guy. Um, any questions at all, guys, especially about anything recent financial planning stuff that's going about, like tax changes, anything about uh, the child tax credit, 
anything else about the listing or any of the Chinese stocks. Um, I'm going to be shifting some of my focus away from covering a lot of Chinese stocks. I'm still going to cover NEO, XPOM, BYD, and a few other things. I'm really going to be, I did kind of a little mini dive into uh, genomic stocks earlier this year. I'm going to cover more of that as we go on. Um, but yeah. All right, guys. Uh, so there's no more questions coming in at this point. I wanted to thank everyone for tuning in today. I have a great time doing this. The only reason I'm not doing prepared videos is because I'm on vacation right now. Uh, and to be honest, I'm partying a lot, having a good time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I will be doing more live streams. Uh, Midos, what do you think about the macro environment? Not sure what you mean by that, by macro environment. Uh, I don't know if you're talking about environmentalism or whatever, but uh, Patrick, uh, you're also a frequent commenter on my my videos and live streams. And I don't know how long you've been a subscriber, but if you've been a subscriber for a while, I'd like to thank you so much. And we're also, you're also a frequent commenter. Uh, thank you so much guys for tuning in. I will see you next time.